the noise, you couldn't, it was, it was freight train coming through. I mean, it was the loudest I've ever heard fire, didn't know it'd sound like that. You could hear the embers, pine cones, twigs, sticks hitting your shelter. I mean, you hear how you could try to prepare for this stuff, but to actually be in it, it's, it's all there. It's just like, holy cow, this is really happening. You had to hold down the fire shelter because the wind was crazy. I mean, it, it, was, it was one of those things if when the fire shelter, the wind was blowing and the fire shelter would kind of collapse, the tent would fall down. You knew the, the heat from the fire shelter touching your Nomex was hot enough where you had to keep creating that air pocket. You'd actually have to hold down the shelter and punch that tent formation back up because you could hear the push going by, you could feel it. Um, you had to be breathing in the ground or through your Nomex, just the air in the shelter was even getting hot to breathe. You know, you're taught to kind of dig a little hole where you put your face because that's the coolest place. There's some people that came out of, when I when we got out of the shelter, I couldn't even recognize them at first because their face was completely covered with, with dirt. I kept my hands right next to my face the whole time, holding the shelter down with my elbows, and I just kind of kept digging the dirt up, and it's real sandy soil there, and so I just kind of kept digging in that. I remember feeling like it was hard to breathe. I remember thinking that my back is on on fire, like the skin, you know, stuff like that, because everything I'd heard of shelter deployments, people get burned still. And so I assumed that I was getting burned. Everywhere that felt really hot, I thought I was burning. Um, that wasn't the case. I didn't receive any burns, but that's, that's what it felt like. And I do remember fighting for not just air, but for something that was cool enough to feel like you could breathe it. Uh, it felt like you were sticking your head in an oven trying to breathe and, you know, kind of unbearable heat. You could hear trees snapping. Uh, you could hear the, the roar of the fire, uh, the wind, all of it combined. It's, it's just kind of like they say, it's it, kind of like a freight train sound when you're inside. Where I grew up, I grew up by a train station, so I, I was used to hearing freight trains uh, when we go play out there. Um, that's what I thought of. I thought I was on a train yard because just the noise was just uh, ridiculously loud. It was hot. It was hard to breathe, breathe initially. I tried to keep my face as close to the water as I could when I could. And at one point I do remember breathing in a little bit of water and, and kind of choking on it and, and spitting it up. I, I think I just put my nose a little too close to the water. Um, the breathing part was, uh, was tough because you didn't know, well, am I gonna stick my hand in the water and not breathe? Or am I gonna try to breathe? Or what are my options here? And at that time I thought, you know, as long as I can feel pain, I must still be alive. Breathing in the shelter, it was hot. Uh, just, I, I was actually taking short breaths in my hands and just holding my breath for as long as I could and then let it out and then try to do it again. I popped my shelter up to look around once the winds had stopped and with everything around us being on fire, except our meadow, uh, I looked down and there was a chipmunk had crawled under my shelter with me. And uh, the chipmunk didn't make it, but that's how like fire shelters helped us make it. The chipmunk had probably breathed in more smoke and hot gases, but he knew to get under something. I hadn't expected to deploy a fire shelter in the black, in an area that had just burned. And so I'd say that there were some factors involved with that that I hadn't necessarily anticipated. Um, one of them was, I'd say the biggest one, was the heat of the ground. I hadn't expected the ground to be so hot when we you know, decided to lay down on top of it. Um, and so my knees, um, pretty much from my knees down and my elbows through my forearms were hot. And uh, anything that had like a button or a zipper, uh, anything that was metal, anything that was close to the ground was hot. Uh, second was the uh, smokiness inside the shelter because everything had just burned there were little stumps and twigs and you know everything that was smoking inside the shelter and filling the shelter up with smoke i'm not claustrophobic at all but i definitely remember thinking this is uncomfortable i don't like this at all i want to be out of here i've heard other burn survivors talk about the roar mine almost sounded like a jet engine it was uh, and i think it's because of the wind and the type of fuels I was trying to hold it down with my elbows and then my, my knees and legs. And, and I remember when the head of the fire hit me, right when it hit my feet, it wanted to lift my feet up and I just dug in. It was hot, but I knew it was, it was bearable. I was able to take it. I knew that I was getting burned, but I, 
I, uh, I just held down there, just kept thinking of my family, um, thinking of my fiance. And I, at that point, I, uh, I, the flame front had just about blown over me. I immediately, it was like standing in front of an oven and full blast and someone shutting it. It, it was the, the, it cooled down tremendously. We crawled under and sheltered up and wound up calling up to our module to tell them we were safe, we had deployed. And then it was kind of hard getting out to them because of the chaos ensuing on the division from 15 engines trying to turn around to get out. And also the fact the shelters inhibited radio communication a bit, so I had a pop my tenant out to talk at times. I could hear Mitch talking on the radio. Uh, he had a few times that he wasn't getting out. Everybody in our department's assigned a radio in 800 megahertz. And when they get out of range, they have a tone, a warning tone. And in the shelters, you're out of range. And then I kind of took my antenna and I stuck it out underneath my flap and I was able to get coverage. Um, I thought a lot about family and friends while I was inside. Um, I, I also thought about the training, all the shelter deployments that I'd been through, the practice shelter deployments. Um, I thought about my boss taking me to a shelter deployment exercise that focused on nothing but site selection instead of run and gun, pop your shelter as quick as you can. And that one come back to me and it, it, it felt like it was a good spot because of the rock wall. Uh, because it would help protect us from a lot of the wind and a lot of the direct flame. We didn't have a lot of fuel loading directly in our site. I did think a lot about how I got in that situation when I was inside there. Uh, you can think a lot about in an hour. Laid in there for a little bit and uh, everything runs through your mind, you know. Uh, we're in a shelter, you know, there's a possibility that this could be our last, you know, the last stand pretty much. So instantly, you know, I started praying right away and, you know, kind of making my peace because I wasn't sure, you know, if this was going to be it. Started praying out loud with Grant for a little bit. Just thinking about my family and everything, it just put a huge at ease over me, you know. It wasn't things moving so fast anymore, even with all the noise and everything like that. It just seemed to be just a, a big calming effect. Well, I thought about my family. I, um, that's, you know, that's about all I thought about. Um, thought about those power lines coming down on top of us. I thought about my family and, and, uh, it, it, it seemed like forever. I know it was only just a couple minutes, but it just seemed like forever that, uh, that noise was going on. You have to have hope. Every firefighter up there has to have hope. And, and to get through any situation, no matter if you're trapped or you're in a situation where you need other people to rescue you, you have to have hope and you have to have faith. And just knowing the guys are coming up, um, hearing those helicopters, hearing the hand crew with starting their chainsaws and their chainsaws going up and hearing that lines are being deployed up towards us, that's what we were holding on to. I remember praying, uh, just asking for uh, guidance and forgiveness and, and making peace. Um, I remember um, thinking of my family, my, my two little kids and my wife, and I think um, focusing on, on my loved ones and, and, and my crew uh, helped me not to freak out as much because I, I was definitely uh, disturbed in the situation I was, I was in. And I just wanted to survive no matter what. I just wanted to get home to see my, my kids and my wife and, and um, focusing on, on being able to do that, I, I think helped me tremendously um, because definitely for a minute there or two, I think I lost touch with um, 
what I needed to do, um, where I was going to go, how I was going to get out of the situation. It's hard to stay in that shelter because it gets so hot, but you just got to keep thinking to yourself, it's a hundred times hotter if you jump out. So that's the only thing that kept me in there. I was thinking, well, oh, this is the only thing that's protecting me right now. Yeah, it was pretty much the only time I really used the shelter was in there. The water was uh, maybe like mid hip, maybe three feet. I started getting hypothermia because I was starting to get the shakes under there. So it was getting cold. I think my adrenaline and the fear and all that of just what was going on, I think finally started to overwhelm, put my body in a little shock. I think it was about an hour and a half later that um, we eventually got out of there. You could barely hear the guy that was right next to you that you were touching elbows with through the shelters. You could barely hear them yell. I remember a lot of people yelling, saying that we should go to the creek. Uh, people yelling back that, no, stay inside. Well, you always hear about people, you know, saying it's really hot and they will just want to get up and run away or take a deep breath and call it. And, you know, I, that, all that played out through my mind and I was just like, that's not going to happen. We're going to ride this one out and, you know, it's got to be way worse out there if it's this hot in here. So you've just got to be, you just got to talk to each other and, you know, coach each other through it, you know. I was fortunate that my firefighter had a level head that, you know, he trusted me. And all well, at the same time, I trusted him not to get up and take off on me. We, uh, I think it was approximately about 15 minutes, which seemed like about 15 days. And, uh, you, there is a tendency, it, you're sitting in that dark thing and uh, it's hot, it's smoky. You really do want to, you want to pick it up and look around to say, hey, you know, do, do I want to run? And that's the last thing. And that was the hardest thing I think for everybody talking to afterwards was suppress that feeling of, I need to jump up and get the hell out of here because it is a, it's a dark, smoky place and uh, you can feel the heat, you can feel the cracking. But the, the biggest thing I think for us was knowing that, that, the guy next to you was still sitting tight. He was next to you and being able to uh, let each other know, hey, everybody's okay, hey, I'm okay, and kind of down the chain. If nothing else, it was nice to know that, okay, we're still supposed to be in here, right? Is everything, everything still status quo as of right now? You're still over there? Yeah, okay, I'm still over here. Hey, you, you still over there? Yeah, I'm still here. Okay, well, we'll, we'll just hang tight until we hear otherwise. So I'd say that was probably the most beneficial thing was that you knew other people were kind of in your same situation. Misery loves company.